Yeah, yeah. Give us, you will give us. This is Zambia, the home of Copa. It's a beautiful Wednesday, the 9th of September in the year 2020. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special and thrilling edition of Bland Talk. The fearless debate where we mention it as it is. I'm your host, my name is Andrew Mwansa. Tonight we base our conversation on the state of national affairs and uh, we'll focus our discussion particularly on five key thematic areas. Number one, we'll look at the economy. We will look at the depreciation of the culture and the biggest question to be answered, who is to blame? Number two, we will look at the state of the economy, like I said. And number two, we will look at uh, the infrastructure development. Now, the Patriotic Front government has embarked on a nationwide infrastructure development. But is this benefiting the people? who we'll get to find out from the discussions. And number three, we will look at one critical issue that is of great concern to the nation, and that is political violence. The PF says the UPND is to blame. The UPND says the PF is to blame. We'll find out about that during this program. Number four, we discuss one important issue also that is of great concern to the nation, and that is Bill 10. Now, you agree with me that Bill 10 has brought more confusion than unity in our country. And the biggest question to be discussed tonight is, is it important to have built and pass, or is it not important? Last but not the least, we'll get to look at one critical issue also that is of great concern to the nation, and this issue borders on, I don't know if my director can, COVID-19, the biggest question as a country, are we winning in the fight against COVID-19, or are we not? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Blunt Talk, the fearless debate. We take a short break, then thereafter I get to introduce my guests. Zambia, Christian nation. Yeah, yeah. Give us, you will give us. This is Zambia, the home of Copa. On oh, tonight's special edition of Blunt Talk, we discuss the state of national affairs. My guest tonight. Are coming through from two political parties. One is coming through from the United Party for National Development. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Mobita Sinawa. Mr. Sinawa, welcome to Blunt Talk. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. My other guest is coming through from the ruling Patriotic Front, and this is Mr. Sande Chilufia Chanda, who is the PF Media Director. Mr. Chanda, good evening and welcome to Blunt Talk. Good evening, thank you, and uh, good evening, dear viewers. For the sake of this discussion, let, allow, me to, allow me to begin with Mr. Nawa. What would you refer, I refer you to as, Mr. Nawa, Nawa, or Mr. C? Just Movita is fine. Movita is fine. Yes. Mr. Chanda, what would you prefer, I refer to you as? Mr. Comrade Sunday. Comrade Sunday. Comrade Sunday. Yeah. Gentlemen, we're discussing the state of national affairs, and the rules of bland talk are very easy. You are given three minutes in which to put your points across, uh, thereafter, your time will be up. I'm sure you'll be able to see, uh, you know, your time popping up on the screen. That will guide you on how you make your submissions. Like I said earlier, we are beginning with the state of the economy, and specifically, we're looking at the depreciation of the quacha. What has gone wrong? We did see uh, just some two days ago, the quacha hit about 20 against the dollar. Let me, allow me to begin with Mr. Chanda, Comrade Chanda. Uh, and if, uh, if my director can put the time so that we are fair in how we, we distribute time to each uh, discussant. Mr. Chanda, who is to blame for the depreciation of the quarter? Your three minutes begin now. Uh, thank you so much, uh, moderator. And uh, once again, a very wonderful evening to our listeners and our viewers, wherever you're watching us from tonight. I'm so honored to be on this platform and uh, share this platform with my dear brother, uh, Comrade Amubita Nawa, 
who I last met as a motivational speaker, and great that I'm meeting him as a politician today. When we talk about the depreciation of the kwacha, we must understand that Zambia does not exist as an island. Zambia exists in the village, or in the global village of nations. The recent depreciation of the kwacha, as we have seen it, could be attributed to, among others, the importation of uh, crude oil, the restocking uh, of Indeni with crude oil, which is ongoing right now. And you know that when you're importing crude oil, you're not using kwacha, you are using your dollar. The importation of agriculture inputs ahead of the coming agricultural season is another reason. Investors could also be waiting for policy direction following the changes at the central bank, the Bank of Zambia. Negative sentiments filtering in official platforms of uh, commercial banks have also caused panic and speculation in the financial markets. That could also be a trigger. The Low reserves could also be attributed to servicing of the debt, which is dollar-based. We must also understand that the low production of and supply in the mining sector is also a major contributor. As you know, that in the advent of COVID-19, the appetite for our copper and our mineral resources to be generic, have dwindled, have gone down. So those who must be buying our minerals are not buying our minerals as we should, and that affects how much foreign exchange you're getting into the country. I also want to place on record here that global economies are still miles away from returning to their pre-pandemic levels. And this has been uh, reported by the Business Insider. And the only country, the only country that is likely to return to its pre-pandemic levels economically is China. Economies around the world still have a long way to go. And this is according to the European Asset Manager Amundi. The asset manager has also downgraded its 2020 economic forecast. Economies such as the U.S. have recorded declines in the second quarter, shrinking by the most since World War II at 33%. The United Kingdom entered a recession for the first time in 11 years when GDP plunged by 20.4% and the Eurozone shrunk by 12.1%. The Eurobond shrunk by 12.1%. Mr. Chanda, sorry we can't proceed. Your three minutes is up. Thank you. Let me come to Mr. Nawa, and I'll pose a similar question, Mr. Nawa. The depreciation of the quarter, who is to blame? First of all, thank you for having me, and uh, it is a pleasure to be joined by my colleague, Mr. Sandy Chanda, uh, and to discuss here. I want to state categorically that uh, I am still a motivational speaker. It is not a crime to have an, um, a profession and to care about politics. Politics is not pangas and knives. Politics is the adjudication of justice and equity amongst everybody in the nation. Just like we currently have a man who is a president, who is a former lawyer, we have ministers who are former journalists, former agriculturalists, a motivational speaker has a right to join politics as well. I also would like to invite at this point, uh, per adventure, since we are still at the pleasantry stage, if possible this debate can be extended as well to the president of the Republic of Zambia one day and hopefully the president of the opposition, uh, UPND. Speaking of uh, uh, the economy, Indeed, economic, economies, there is no economy that is in, it, in a vacuum. That is why every economy must be managed with the most 
prudent management skills possible. And I really like the laundry list of COVID and Indeni and dollar this. These are things that have existed even before this time. And even as we look at the economy of Zambia, according to the statement that was issued by the recently fired Bank of Zambia governor, the economy of Zambia was already in critical condition even pre-COVID. The interest rates of Zambia were already close to 40%. The lending rates, uh, inflation was already above 16%. At pre-COVID, the projected growth of the Zambian economy was at 2%. Past COVID, the projected growth rate of Zambian economy is negative 5%. So as much as COVID is a wonderful excuse for certain people to utilize, the economy of Zambia is in shambles due to lack of prudent management by the people in charge of the economy. Uh, we can talk about the appetite for copper. There is just an appetite for a lack of economic prudential management. For example, the trouble with the Zambian economy right now is the current government has overborrowed. When President Kaunda, who had led this country for 27 years, left the office of president, he left a debt of $7 billion. The current president, who has been in office two terms, a total of almost four years, has already accrued a debt of $11.9 billion foreign debt and $8 billion uh, in local debt. So Zambia right now is tendering around $21 billion in debt. Zambia is paying $200 million US dollars, paying for loans in interest. And in 2022, we have a big bond that is due of $750 million. Here is the problem. Zambia is like a man who is dating eight women. He has no job. He has no vision. He doesn't do piecework. And he likes to look flashy in cars that are borrowed. And to those women, when they ask him for food, that man says, but I've built roads for you. That man says to them, no, let us blame the other people who are here, the five other people who are here. The problem with Zambia's economy is that it is, it is heavy on debt, no income generation whatsoever, and there is a lot of corruption. People are abusing public resources. That is the problem. Uh, with thank the you so much for that submission. Allow me to... Uh, you know, get to the core of this, you know, discussion regarding the economy. Mr. Nawaz mentioned a lot of issues that I, I believe you like to respond to. One of the critical issues is, uh, you know, made mention of is the fact that we've overborrowed as a country. Uh, there's too much corruption in this country. In three minutes, I want you to respond to some of the issues that Mr. Nawa has, you know, uh, has risen. Mr. Chanda, your three minutes begin now. Thank you. Let me firstly uh, begin to say that, uh, begin by saying that uh, being a motivational speaker is not a crime. It is allowed. Being a youth activist is allowed. And uh, when you're a youth activist hiding behind uh, the curtains of a political party, you must be courageous enough to come out. And I'm glad that today I'm facing my brother as a member of the United Party for National Development. Let me make it very clear here that uh, pre-COVID, we were coming out of a devastating season with climate change. It's a no-brainer that with climate change, Zambia, the Zambian economy, lost the projection is that the Zambian economy was impacted to the tune of 7.1 billion U.S. dollars because of, as a result of Zambia's worst rainfall scenario. If you are coming from a devastating climate situation like we did with climate change, and you walk into COVID, you clearly do not expect that uh, everything is going to be business as usual. It is a fallacy. Let me also say that my brother says uh, the catalogue, you know, that I ran through in Danian COVID existed before this, uh, before this time. I don't know what he meant because COVID is a new phenomenon. The whole world is dealing with COVID as a new phenomenon. The impact of COVID on the economy just in the year 2020 is estimated to be at one trillion US dollars, 2020 alone. If countries like the United States of America, like I alluded to, if countries like the United Kingdom can enter a recession, 
what is a Zambian economy? If countries like South Africa could enter a recession, this is the second largest economy on the continent of Africa, what is a Zambian economy compared to these economies? Let me also put it very clear that the Patriotic Front has borrowed for production. The Patriotic Front has not borrowed for sure. The Patriotic Front has not borrowed for consumption. We borrowed for investment. The Patriotic Front, contrary to what my colleague placed on, uh, you know, before, before this house, the Patriotic Front is that responsible father building a house, preparing for the future of his family. And he will say to his family, we are going to put away luxuries for now because the future is important. Let me also state here, without beating about the bush, that investment in infrastructure that we have borrowed for is a precursor for development. I'll allow you to continue later on, but your time, according to my timer there on the screen, is up. Now, one of the critical issues that you've mentioned, Mr. Chanda, is the fact that as a country, uh, this continued economic doldrum we're in, you know, could be attributed to the fact that we are hit by natural phenomena, and you did make mention of the, you know, the drought and, and all these other issues. I want Mr. Mr. Nawa, Mr. Mowita, to respond, uh, you know, to some of these issues that Mr. Uh, Mr. Chanda has raised. I have never denied the fact that COVID exists, nor that it has affected Zambians, but we cannot live in a time where we are comparing our lifestyles to neighbours. The woman out there in the streets who's trying to make her business tick does not want a, a government that is going to give excuses as to why she's not eating. The teacher doesn't want excuses as, as to why she has no salaries. I'll give you an example. As of November, this was slightly pre-COVID or just when COVID rumors were starting to emerge, November of 2018, the Zambian uh, dollar rate, Zambia kwacha to dollar rate, was already around 15 kwacha as of uh, November. From the time the Patriotic Front took power to today, to, to this day, the Zambian kwacha has depreciated, depreciated 300% compared to the dollar. Our neighbor, Tanzania, their shilling has depreciated 7% over the past 20 years. The South African rand is still holding strong against the dollar. The depreciation rate is somewhere around 8 to 9%. So we cannot use a global problem to, to justify our inability to prepare for pandemic. Every government must have a contingency plan. It must have reserves, which the Patriotic Front found I mean, $2.5 billion in reserves that Rupia Banda left. That money doesn't exist anymore. Why? It is clear that the economy of Zambia, the Patriotic Front needs to admit that they are good at building roads at very exorbitant price of 2.8 million per kilometer but they are not good at managing an economy. If the Patriotic Front want to run a Ministry of Roads, Department and Housing, building houses for police officers, that's not the vision of Zambia. We need a Zambia where police officers can build their own houses. Besides, those houses they have built, that's borrowed money. The luxury that my brother says they have forfeited, the president bought an expensive $130 million jet at the height of austerity measures. The president is not a procurement okay? officer. The president could never have allowed, I cannot allow my child to bring a jet at my home and then ride in it and say I'm not a procurement officer. Then I'm not a responsible father. If the president is not a procurement officer, he should have said, where are we getting this jet? Take it back. That is the leadership Zambia needs, where we refuse luxuries and not say I'm not a procurement officer. You've brought me a Gulf Stream that belongs to billionaires. Zambia is a poor country based on our reserves, based on our bank account, and the president should never have been driving a, a, a $130 million jet. Rwanda is building solar uh, uh, generators and solar plants for $23, $27 million. People are facing load shedding right now because the priorities of this government is about roads, luxury. How do we steal money? How do we procure? How do we manipulate the system so that we become wealthy? That is the priority of this government. We need someone who will prioritize students, who will prioritize widows, retirees for goodness sake. They bypass those retirees for six months. Thank you so much. Thank you. You've made mention of the fact that the PF are good at building roads. Uh, Mr. Chanda, you did make mention, you, you didn't refuse the fact that, yes, the, 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 the government has borrowed, but 
this money that we've borrowed, we've uh, invested it in infrastructural development. Allow me to, to ask you one question, Mr. Chanda. The money that we are, you know, uh, invested into infrastructural development, was this money budgeted for? And, and in answering that, I, I want to um, read to you what Mr. Kalialia, the governor that, you know, was uh, fired, stated. He says our challenge until now is that we don't have infrastructure budget and most of the money being borrowed is going into infrastructure at the expense of other sectors. If we remove some of the capital projects that we are not, we, we, we are, we are not uh, agent, then we can say we are moving in the right direction, he said. Well, I mean, let me, let me treat that as uh, his opinion. Let me stick to the issues that are coming uh, out uh, in the, from this discussion. Number one, someone says that uh, reserves no longer exist, that uh, the previous government left us with reserves. What is the point of having your reserves and you can't take a hospital to Kanchivir? What is the point of having reserves and you can't take development to the most rural of our people? What is the essence of those reserves when you cannot embark on rural electrification? What is the essence of uh, your reserves when it cannot translate into good roads, hospitals, schools, etc.? Reserves exist except they exist in the form of the infrastructure projects that you're seeing littered across the country. The people of Zambia and Shangombo deserve the sort of development infrastructure, the network, telecom network that anybody in Lusaka has, is uh, accessing. So you cannot segregate and start boasting about reserves. Do reserves put money? Do they put bread and butter on the table? Let me also make it very clear here that, you know, when you want to talk about Tanzania, you want to talk about South Africa, you're comparing a mango to an orange. Tanzania has access to the sea. You are a landlocked country for crying out loud. South Africa has access to the sea. You are a landlocked country for crying out loud. What do you do? when you are a landlocked country surrounded by eight neighboring countries. This is what you do. Zambia is not guided by individual plans and theories. Zambia is guided by a national vision, the Vision 2030. What does this vision say? It's not a PF vision, it's not a UPND vision, it's a national vision. This vision says, by the year 2030, we must transform Zambia into a prosperous, middle-income nation by 2030, and to create a new Zambia, which is a strong and dynamic middle-income industrial nation that provides opportunities for improving the well-being of all, embodying values of socioeconomic justice. How do you do that? You must transition from being a landlocked country to a land-linked country. There must come a time in the life of this nation when Zambia must say we are no longer landlocked, we are land-linked. We are at the center of eight neighboring countries. This is not a disadvantage. It is an advantage. How do you do that? You invest in infrastructure. Invest in your roads. Invest in your uh, rail line. Invest in your airports. That is what responsible and futuristic governments do. Let me also place on record here that infrastructure development is critical to achieve Zambia's objective of becoming a prosperous middle-income country by the year 2030. This is a vision that we have set for ourselves. I'm sorry, Mr. Chanda, your time is up. As you can hear from the bell, uh, you've made mention of the fact that infrastructural development is key in order for us to, um, you know, to, 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 to realize vision 2030 of making uh, Zambia a middle-income country at that time. Allow me to get to uh, Mr. Nawa. Mr. Nawa, I think you visibly you can see uh, massive infrastructural development happen in our country. D do you think this is trickling down to the people? How is infrastructural development a benefit to the local people? Um, we need to be careful with words. Semantics are very deceitful. And when you tell people I've brought infrastructure development, we need to question what type of development. Zambians somehow are at a new level now. You see, a lot of students have graduated. A lot of people have turned 16, 17, 18, 18 years. A lot of people are learned now. So if you're just going to come with words that we've developed infrastructure, the people now are critical thinkers, and we have changed our mindset. 
You know, we don't want just the sound of songs. So I'll give you an example. The Ndola um, Lusaka Road was costed at almost $2.5 billion by this government. Now, if you go to South Africa where they don't build roads every six months, Lumumba Road was done uh, this year. Uh, Mungui Road was done this year. This year alone, those two roads have been done twice. Now, is that the right infrastructure development? I would rather walk barefoot and have good food at home than have a skorokoro infrastructure and be proud about useless, substandard, non-international roads. Also, some of the infrastructure they are bringing is overpriced. Two, these people travel. My brother travels. The president travels. I lived in Dallas, Texas. If you look at the roads they built in Dallas, Texas 30 years ago, compared to the roads we are building now, we are still behind. Look at the roads Dr. Kaunda built. Look at Phoenix Construction. There are roads Phoenix Construction built in Zambia 30 years ago, including Kapiri and Indola Road. To this day, that road is still standing. And if it had the right government to maintain it, it would be cheaper to maintain a road. Look at the Chirundu Akafue Road. It's a very beautiful road. It was done seven, eight, nine years ago, but no one is maintaining it. So for me, I don't eat the word infrastructure development. What we need is a transparent government. And speaking of the Vision 2030, here was the objective. It said it is expected to reduce inequalities and move the nation significantly up the scale of human development. According to human standard development, which is economic development, social e development, freedom of press and expression, freedom of entrepreneurship, lower taxes for everybody, real money in people's pockets, not slogans, Zambia is lagging behind. And for me, I am way past that stage of listening to rhetoric and words and songs that sound good. Zambians want food, not songs, not slogans. An allowance of 25 seconds. I don't know if I can still... I don't trust. need to use it. Oh, great. Awesome. Uh, he's mentioned a lot of things regarding Vision 2030 and how, you know, purely what you say is uh, more or less like semantics, really, you know, what is happening on the ground and what you're saying. Don't stand at pari passu, Mr. Chanda. Um, let's get to an understanding from you, uh, you know, f f f from the patriotic front vision in, in regards to uh, infrastructural development. What was the idea behind uh, infrastructural development and how does this trickle down to the local people? How do they benefit from the roads? How do they benefit from the buildings they are constructing? Let me unpack. Before I do, real money, not semantics. 10 billion kwacha stimulus package for businesses under COVID. The simple reason, keep business afloat. Six million US dollars aquaculture value addition fund for young, young people to get involved in the aquaculture value chain. Not rhetoric, real money in people's pockets. 470 million youth empowerment fund targeting 150,000 beneficiaries. Real money, not rhetoric. 30 million kwacha for artists. Not rhetoric, real money in people's pockets. And I'm so happy that the president of Zambia will address the nation on Friday as he opens parliament. And I pray that everybody will be tuned in. Now, roads, hospitals, schools, bring them closer to where the people are. If you are a farmer in my area of heritage, Kanchibia, and you are driving on a bad road, each grain that falls off from your bag is a dollar. It's a cent. It's kwacha. If you compare that with having a good road, it will get you to your marketplace in good time. You serve on your produce. If you are sick or you are an expectant mother in the village and you must get to the next health facility and you must travel, 30, 50, 40, 100 kilometers to access the nearest facility as opposed to us bringing you a hospital closer to your vicinity. You know the difference between life and death. If you are a young person and you must travel 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers, I, mean, I, can, I can hear myself. If you are a young person 
and you must walk 15, 20, 30 kilometers every day to go to school. And we bring you a school within your vicinity, you'll appreciate the difference. I come and I'm always in an area called country and in the rural parts of this country, I've been to all parts of Zambia and I've seen how poverty looks like. And I know the difference between taking electricity in an area that was once neglected like Shangombo. I know what it means to take development in an area that was once neglected like Mitete. People can now call, you can send money, you don't need to go to the post office, just on your phone and you send someone money and they'll get it right there and then. You know the difference of taking development. Your, your three minutes is up. Now we are getting into a segment called Face Off. So I, I need you to face each other, Mr. Chanda and Mr. Mubita. I need you to face each other. I need you, Mr. Ch Mr. Mubita, to ask a question to Mr. Chanda and vice versa, Mr. Chanda, ask a question to Mr. Mubita. In case I missed any that you think is very crucial. Mr. Ch Mr. Mubita, your turn. All right. And just guide us further. When I ask the question, do I wait for his response? Yes, like you wait for his response. And then, then I rebut. Okay, yes, thank yes, yes. you. So, Mr. Chand, I wanted to ask you, do you rent or do you own your own house? I own my house. You own your own house. Yes. What proof do you have that you own your own house? Title deed. Title deed. Yes. So, if I go to the registry, I can find your name with that plot now. Positive. Congratulations. Thank you. So, do you say to me it is easy to find an owner of a house going to the registry, right? I don't work for the Minister of Lands, for mm -hmm. starters, mm -hmm. and I don't want to masquerade as one who works for the Minister of Lands. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you for a fact that um, I own property. Okay. And not only do I own property, I also own cattle. Okay. I own goats, so I'm a kachem, as you see me. Awesome. Yes, and I'm getting into fish farming. I own both uh, statutory land, but also own traditional land. Which is in your name. In my name. Meaning, when you are getting electricity, that title was in your name. You had to prove to Zesco. Isn't that right? Of course. So, if you have title to your land, I can go to verify your land. How come the President of the Republic of Zambia has failed to find an owner of 48 houses, an entire president, an entire president who swore oath to defend the Constitution of Zambia, who promised to protect the people and citizens of Zambia, has failed through his defunct, non-functional, almost useless anti-corruption commission, and the president had to tell the anti-corruption to find the owners. To this day, we don't know the owners. Uh, allow Mr. Chandler to respond to that. Respond. It was precise. For, for starters, um, the president of the Republic of Zambia, anyone who's read the Constitution of Zambia, will understand that the president is not the investigator general. We have separation of powers. The duties of the president are spelled out clearly in the Constitution. And unless we want to trade ignorance and emotion in the public space. Secondly, I want to inform you that the owner of the 48 houses is a nephew to one of your leaders in the, in the UPND. So if there's anybody you must be asking about the 48 houses, go and ask one of your leaders in the National Management Committee of the UPND. Now, that is a moral A minute moral. ago you said you don't wait for the A minute ago I'm, you said... I'm, 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 I'm answering. I, I'll give it to your leader, yeah. your leader, Mr. Hakande Hichilema, my brother who I love with all my heart, and I mean it, went to the Anti-Corruption Commission, and he told the nation that he had evidence. He told the nation that he had evidence, and he went to the Anti-Corruption Commission and caused a stunt. To this day... Your leader has failed to tell the Zambian people the kind of evidence he had. So through you and to my elder brother, Mr. Hakainde Hichilema, I want to pose a question in reverse. Who owns the 48 houses? Are they owned by a member of your national management committee? And if there's anyone who says no, I am ready within the next 48 hours to give the name of a senior member of the UPND who is an uncle to the gentleman who owns the 48 houses. Simple. Uh, it's your turn now, Mr. Chanda, to face Mr. Nawa and ask him a question that he's going to respond to. Thank you. My brother, in the year 2017, you wrote a letter 
urging our colleagues in the diaspora to come back to Zambia. And this was published by Zambia Reports on the 29th of May, 2017. Let me remove my glasses for on grounds of optical handcap C. Under bullet four, you said it's better here. And I quote, in the nine years I lived in the US, I never had a maid. I couldn't afford one. In the nine years I've lived in Zambia, even my maids have maids. My gardeners have gardens. My drivers will soon own cars. In America, we seek empowerment. In Zambia, we empower others. This was 2017. You still stand by what you wrote in 2017? Absolutely. Okay. Zambia is a land of opportunities. It is a land where everybody must prosper. And the truth of the matter is, when I lived in America, my last salary was $26,000 per year. But the economy was so expensive that I couldn't afford to do those things. The beauty of Zambia is we can empower one another at a small scale. The trouble with what is happening now, since 2017, by the way, in 2017, the U.S. dollar to the kwacha was around 8 to 12,000 kwacha, 10, 8,000 kwacha, somewhere there. Now it's at 20. So I wouldn't say exactly the same things that I said because there's been gross mismanagement since then. And the challenge now, is we have ministers who can afford to grow grocery shopping for two million kwacha, and an ordinary Zambian can't even take his 2,000 kwacha and pay rent, taxes, we are overtaxed, people are suffering, electricity, 100 kwacha. In 2017, I could buy units for 50 kwacha that would last me a week to two weeks. Today, 100 kwacha units can't even last me 48 hours. So as much as I said wonderful things about Zambia, and I still believe in Zambia, that's why I'm here today, I don't say the same nice things about your leadership because it has neglected the suffering of Zambians and your leadership has become very rich. You are wonderful, you are blessed, you own Keto, that's lovely and I celebrate you. I would like you one day to bring an audit. I can tell you how I make my money, I can show you my salary, I can show you all my businesses, I can show you how much I made last week. I would like you to show me your salary your pay slip. I would like your ministers to show me their salaries. There are people we used to work with in the streets. Now they afford two brand new GXs worth 1.4 billion, a million kwacha each. Please, we need a lifestyle audit in Zambia, starting with the head of state who was worth 2 million kwacha in 2015 and now is worth 24, 25 million kwacha. We need an audit of the president, including yourself. I will offer myself. I will show you how many houses I own, how many farms I own. I will show you what I make every day and how I make it. I would like you and your ministers to do the same. Thank you. Um, Gentlemen, thank you so much for that particular, you know, uh, um, uh, segment. That, that segment is called Face Off, where you get to ask each other questions. Let's move on to another critical issue, that is an issue of political violence. Now, year in, year out, every time we have an election, uh, political violence is one of the most frequent um, issues that, uh, you know, we are, we are faced with as a country. Um, I would like to know, fr from, from, from the side of the patriotic front, what the party is doing to ensure that political violence you know, becomes an issue of the past. First and foremost, let me um, start by saying that the patriotic front and the leadership of the patriotic front condemns violence irrespective of the perpetrator. The patriotic front will never and does not and has not justified violence as a form of self-defense. We have never and we will never justify violence as a tool for winning or defending an election because an eye for an eye makes the world go blind. The president of the Republic of Zambia, who also happens to be president of the Patriotic Front, has been very clear that when a member of the party commits a crime under the disguise or hiding behind the veil of the party, they'll be on their own when they face the consequences of the law. Our position with, with regard to violence, and what are we doing about it? The Patriotic Front has embarked on political education. Political education entails that you train your members to understand that a political opponent is not an enemy that you can have divergent views, 
but you can differ to disagree without becoming personally disagreeable. That is a philosophy under the patriotic front and moving towards heightened political education. We are not like those who have celebrated the Mapatizia formula. We are not like those who say that uh, violence is a form of self-defense because violence negates the very aspirations of what democracy stands for. The more reason why we are having by-elections as we speak, we have campaigns in Lukasha, we have campaigns in, um, in Luapula province, and the reason is simple. The Secretary General of the ruling party said we are not allowing cadres to move from outside towns to go into Lukasha or to go into Mansabombwe because we do not want to import violence. People who have lived together, they coexist, will not attack each other. The more reason why we are saying, let's not have outsiders going into these areas, and we stand with a position that has been taken by the Zambia police and as announced by the Inspector General of Police, uh, Mr. Kakoma Kanganja. So the patriotic front abhors violence, and uh, we take a position that violence is evil, and that uh, anyone who resorts to violence does so because they have no message for the people. That is our position. And we will continue to ensure that we stick to issue-based campaigns, telling the people of Zambia about the development that they need to see. Both in violent speech and physical violence is uh, what we stand against. Thank you so much, Mr. Chanda. Let me come to you, Mr. Now. I think um, uh, Mr. Chanda has mentioned something very uh, profound. I think uh, we've seen the leader of the United Party for National Development, HH, uh, you know, coming out and stating that uh, if uh, you have been beaten, ensure that you defend yourself. Uh, he's described it as, uh, you know, uh, you want to use violence to bring about peace. But I want to understand from you, from your perspectives uh, as the UPND, don't you think this is a recipe for anarchy if you're going to tell people defend yourself, if you're going to tell people punch back when they punch you. Isn't this you know, a recipe for anarchy? Allow me to quote Martin Luther King who said, nonviolence is a powerful and just weapon which cuts without wounding and ennobles the man who wields it. It is a sword that heals, end of quote. I would love for a nation that is peaceful. I would love this dialogue to continue there is no need for us to kill one another. And I think as Zambians, we have to wake up, regardless of whether you're UPND or PF or anybody else, to wake up and say, we are truly in the same nation and we ought not to fight one another. Having said that, there is a law in the Constitution of Zambia or anywhere that allows you to defend yourself. That is a constitutional right. Even you in your home, if somebody comes to kill your wife, your daughter, you have a right to defend yourself. Now, before we condemn the one who said, defend yourself, why shouldn't we question the one who sent the one who came to violate the self-defending person? We ought to reach a, a stage as a nation. I would invite my brother for him to take me with me to his tea places, coffee places. We go and make donations in the community. I would like me to be seen with him and him to be seen with me. We are not enemies. We are not fighting the color green or the color red. We ought to fight for the color orange in our flag, the black in our skin, the, the, the green in our vegetation and all that, the things that symbolize us. I think I'm personally tired of this president saying it's this one to blame, it's this one to blame. If two adults, and that is President Edgar Lungu and President Haka Inde Ichilema can meet tomorrow and have coffee somewhere and shake hands as leaders. It shouldn't be, no, you follow me, no, you follow me, no, you follow me. In fact, the person in power should be the most powerful. Lastly, violence is not just beating people. Issuing NRCs to teenagers who are below the age 16 is a violation of the Constitution of Zambia according to the Registration Act, Chapter 158 disenfranchising people, voter registration, stealing votes, uh, making sure that the, right now the voter registration is supposed to be in the western province and southern province. They have said they cannot do it anymore. But they themselves are registering young people. That is violence. There is economic violence. There is verbal violence. There is social violence. Anything that you do to disenfranchise people is a violation of their right. I think when we, we start to lead from a point of justice, 
not a point of political affiliation. I am tired of party politics. I want a leader who will fight for this nation, who will bring peace to this nation and harmonize the tribes. There was a video a few days ago of a person uh, campaigning. I was expecting Mr. Chanda to say, no, 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 no. That is not the party position where you're calling other people dogs and so on and so forth. These racial divides should be illegal. And I expect my leaders on the other side to take charge of the people. Honestly speaking, the violence starts from the people with power. And if we can also take power from the police, when the police have no power to defend me, what do you want me to do? To sit there and watch a bunch of people beat me because I'm wearing a red barrette? No, mm. I ought to defend Sorry, your time myself. is up, Mr. Now. Now, you've mentioned a lot of issues that are very critical uh, to this discussion. Uh, Mr. Chanda, you too mentioned one of the programs that you're conducting or undertaking as a party, that is political education. But I think we've seen the president issue number of statements regarding him condemning uh, political violence. But this violence has continued, Mr. Chanda. You're, you're a witness to that. Do you really think um, the reason why, you know, uh, maybe this violence has continued is because maybe the, the president hasn't been that serious to ensure that political violence indeed come to, to a stop? Mr. Monsan, unless you expect the president to start moving with a whip and uh, whip everybody and... Um, uh, he must uh, start. He must begin to make orders and uh, say this one must be arrested and arrest that one. And uh, I can tell you, if that is a path and that is a route, some of the opposition party leaders we have in this country will be behind bars without without doubt. Um, my brother speaks of NRCs being issued to infants. This is a UPND practice. This happened in UPND. Whether it's 2016, whether it's with the issuance of NRCs, whether it's a voter registration, go to ECZ. See how many people were removed from the voters' register uh, and uh, what, uh, what UPND was doing. The photos we are talking about, these are file photos from 2016, and we have seen them being circulated all over social media. Secondly, it's very easy for, for anyone to get NRCs and parade little children and uh, give them and say these are the owners of these NRCs. How do we know that uh, those NRCs are bearing details of those little children and the photos that we're seeing uh, flooded on social media? So it's, it's cheap propaganda and it doesn't sell. You know, it doesn't just sell. Um, let me also make it very clear here that um, when we speak about violence, violence can be physical and non-physical, verbal and non-verbal. And I agree with, uh, with my brother. What is important is that when you want to talk about self-defense, the doctrine of self-defense, you can only invoke that doctrine of self-defense when there's an imminent threat, number one, or when there's provocation. I'm not going to say to you as you go to uh, Kanchibia, go with uh, pangas just in case you are attacked. That's no self-defense. You are inciting your people to attack. That is what it means. The ideal situation which uh, Comrade Mowita talks about is what I believe in, that we can have politics that are issue-based, devoid of political violence and uh, pangas and hate speech. Look at this. Look at um, the hate speech and the verbal violence against uh, the head of state by some online uh, media associated with uh, Mr. Movita's uh, party. To this, day, no, one's, no one wants to take responsibility. The president has been called names. He's a father. He's a husband. He's someone's uncle before he's president. He's been dehumanized insulted by media outlets that belong to the UPND. That is violence. And today, if anyone wants to talk about dealing with the question of violence, let's mm. get there. Let's be as blunt as we are on this platform. Amazing. Let's get to another critical issue. Uh, I think of about 25 minutes before we close the show. Um, Another critical issue that is of great concern is Bill Number no. 10, that is uh, Constitutional Amendment Bill Number no. 10 of 2019. Um, the UPN, you've been on record through your president, uh, calling for the immediate withdrawal of this particular bill. Uh, the PF have argued on the contrary that this bill is important. Let me get it from the perspective of the UPND. 
Is Biltain important or should we forget about this Biltain? Um, every bill in the country is important. But we have to ask ourselves, why is it that the Constitution of Zambia is the most amended constitution in the southern Africa. Every president that comes amends constitution. This current president has already amended it before. And when they were not satisfied, they are about to amend it. And the stance of the UPND is very simple. This constitution seeks to take away power from chiefs. And now chiefs will be appointed through parliament. This bill amendment seeks to take away uh, the acquisition of loans from central bank to I don't know who. This bill seeks to demolish uh, the management of provinces from statutory management processes to where they would dictate all of that. This bill seeks the removal of any presidential candidate at will based on mental disqualification or just anything. You know, it, it wants to empower the president in a way that the president can literally say, uh, this one is not a good candidate, let him move. This bill seeks to change the modality for what is called a third term. Already the Patriotic Front government has amended the constitution already to help President Edgar Lungu to stand for a third term. Everybody knows that President Lungu is standing for a third term. Everybody knows. Anybody who refuses that either doesn't know how to count or was not there in 2015. This is a third term. The law of Zambia said before amendment that whoever has been inaugurated and sworn in, that is a term. Whether you are sworn in for one day or one week, you are sworn in. So this bill, in short, seeks to empower the president of this republic to be able to borrow money without parliamentary oversight. This bill seeks to disenfranchise citizens from having a say in the judicial jurisprudence. In other words, what I feel this bill 10 is, it is a, a scapegoat for the patriotic front to elongate their stay in power. All the ministers in this government who are key, the chairperson of this party, they have all stated that to remove them from power will be an impossible task. They have stated clearly and categorically that they want to stay longer and they want to rule Zambia forever. And we all know that is not possible because the Zambian people are tired of suffering under this government through economic uh, suffering. In other words, Bill 10 is not a bill that is supposed to empower citizens. Bill 10 is a bill that will successfully empower my brother uh, and his party so that they can manipulate the laws of Zambia to themselves. What kind of government do we want that doesn't have oversight? So much, Mr. Nawa, uh, for that submission. Let me draw the conversation to Mr. Chanda. Uh, you've had you know, uh, a number of issues that have been raised. But even before you can rebuttal to those, why is Biltain important to the people of Zambia? Maybe before dealing with why Biltain is important to the people of Zambia, allow me, uh, moderator, to make it very clear here that um, according to the UPND, the people of Zambia have been tied since 2006. The people of Zambia were tied in 2006, the people of Zambia were tied in 2008, the people of Zambia were tied in 2011, the people of Zambia were tied in 2015, the people of Zambia were tied in 2016, and the people of Zambia will be tied in 2021. We don't know what sort of tiredness that, I mean, that is. You know, it's, it's strange, you know, it's strange. We better find a new term for it. Uh, my brother talks about butane in a very strange way. I have never encountered butane that uh, talks about, um, you know, central bank. For starters, central bank does not acquire loans. I'm hearing it for the first time from my brother. Central bank doesn't acquire loans. Um, secondly, central bank, Bank of Zambia made its own submissions to, into the, uh, into the butane, and those are captured in the, in the manner that they had presented and submitted, just like the judiciary. There has been no tempering, no doctoring whatsoever. The president does not borrow money. He doesn't. It's not one of his functions. We must be very, very clear. And um, again, it's important, you know, when my brother talks about, um, you know, where the president going for a third term, there's a reason why legal language is not layman's language. There's a reason why. The UPND lawyers had problems with 14 days and whether it included, you know, holidays and, and, and they didn't include holidays. 
There's a reason. The reason is very simple. The Constitution of Zambia defines a term. The Constitution of Zambia defines a term. The Constitution of Zambia defines what having held office twice means or what holding office implies. And I don't think I want to waste my three minutes to do this uh, sort of lecture. Bill 10 is important for the people of Zambia for the following reasons. A young person from the university, a young person from the college, a young person from um, a secondary school, for as long as you meet uh, qual your qualifications to contest as member of parliament, you can be assured of representation in parliament. Youth representation. Secondly, women representation. Thirdly, representation of our brothers and sisters who are differently abled in parliament. I want someone who says, you don't need youth representation, you don't need women representation, you don't need the differently abled people represented in parliament. I want someone who says that we don't need to put a stop to the endless by-elections. Bill 10 says we can put a stop to these by-elections because they are a huge cost. But as it is, by-elections are law. And we're saying let the legislators go and amend the law. Thank you so much, Mr. Chanda, for that submission. We'll take a short break, and uh, as we come, we get to round two of face-off. And, and this round two of face-off, I want you to be very specific in how you ask. And uh, I, I want specifically <coughs> on Bill 10. I don't want personal issues. I want Bill 10. Ask Mr. Chanda, Mr. Chanda, ask Mr. Nawa uh, what you need answers uh, from, from, from the party's position on Bill 10. For now, we take a short break. I will be back on the other side as we continue discussing national affairs. Zambia, Christian nation. Yeah, yeah. Give us you, give us. <laughs> this is Zambia, the home of copper. This is Blunt Talk, the fearless debate we're discussing the state of national affairs. My guests is Mobita Nawa from the United Party for National Development and Mr. Sandy Chanda, uh, the PF Media Director. We are now on round two of Face Off, and in round two of F for Face Off, we are discussing Bill 10 and some of the issues the two political parties have with each other regarding Bill 10. And this time around, we'll start with Mr. Chanda. Mr. Chanda, I want you to face Mr. Nawa and uh, ask him a question on Bill 10. My brother. Do you believe that the differently abled must have representation in parliament? Yes, absolutely, and thank you very much. I think disability is not inability, and uh, we have seen even when uh, um, President Kaunda was president, there was a man called Lazarus Tembo. He was a minister, a fantastic minister. Uh, he was one of the highest ranking uh, differently abled people who have ever risen. But there was no Bill 10 then. Dr. Kaunda just appointed Mr. Lazarus Tembo as differently disabled as he was to say you can qualify. And right now we have a lot of people who are differently able who, who qualify right now with or without bill. You don't need a bill to appoint somebody who's differently able. I have a brother-in-law. Uh, he's a teacher. He's, he's, he's blind. He doesn't see, but he's an amazing teacher. And if I had an opportunity, I would definitely appoint him. I don't need bill 10 to appoint people who are differently abled. When you love people who are different from you, you will appoint them. You don't need a bill to, you don't need to, to cover up what you want to do. Yes, thank you. I want you to ask first Mr. Chanda and thank ask you. him a question regarding Bill 10. Mr. Chanda, Mr. Nawa is facing you. Mr. Chanda, do you think uh, Drug Enforcement Commission and uh, uh, Financial Intelligence Center should be merged as proposed in Bill 10 and why? Thank you so much. I want to respect the submissions uh, made by the FIC and uh, the Drug Enforcement Commission for the simple reason that um, a greater component of what uh, drug enforcement will deal with is money laundering. And uh, what uh, the Financial Intelligence Center deals with uh, is also money laundering to an extent. 
And uh, if there's common ground, you don't need to duplicate uh, roles and functions of uh, these agencies. And so for as long as it leads to efficiency and effectiveness, I have no problem. Yeah. Um, let me ask a question to Mr. Chanda, and then I'll, I'll subsequently ask Mr. Nawa. Um, how urgent do we need Bill 10? Can't it wait until the 2021 general elections? If you were to ask me, we, and maybe uh, I'll write on uh, my brother's submission, that you don't need Bill 10 to appoint someone differently abled to be in Parliament. But there's everything good about putting that in your pieces of legislation, in the supreme law of the land, that it doesn't need to be about your will and your wish. It is a requirement as proportional representation, safe seats for our differently abled uh, colleagues, for the young people of this country, for the women of this country, and um, that uh, we can clarify these things like for with these 14 days, push that to 30, uh, 30 days and let people have ample time to, to argue. You ask me, can Buten wait? And I'll tell you that the reason why a constitution is not cast in stone is because a constitution is a living document. And as and when times dictate, you must go back to your constitution and reform it to fit and to suit the challenges of the now. If my statistics is correct, Zambia has about one million differently abled people. You cannot sacrifice this important segment in the population to just someone's will and wish. Make it and put it in the law that their representation matters. Can it wait? I would say it cannot wait. It mustn't wait. We had a situation in 2016 with the Bill of Rights, the referendum on the Bill of Rights. Today, Zambians would have had better rights, uh, rights to education, right to shelter, right to safe and clean drinking water, etc. But because of politics, we suffocated that piece of legislation. We have allowed politics into Bill 10. If for a moment we took our political lenses off and said to ourselves, what is Bill 10 talking about? Can we mark and cross out what we need and what we don't need? That should be the scandal conversation I would want to have. That number one, Bill 10 talks about this as UPND, we don't think this is good and PF says it's good and everything consensus, okay, that falls out. Can we have this? That falls out, etc. Mm. You cannot say that you want to put a caveat on reforming your laws. A constitution is a living document and amendments must be an ongoing process. It doesn't matter how many times you amend your law. Amend your law because society is dynamic. Very, uh, you know, impressive submission there. Let me get to Mr. Nawa. Mr. Sande speaks of the fact that can we mark and cross out issues that we don't like. Your party has been on record of walking out of parliament every time the bill is about to be debated. Don't you think, to some extent, um, his argument, you know, holds a lot of water? Why don't you discuss, meet somewhere and, 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 and probably work on this document? Isn't that important? So the Patriotic Front has 80 members of parliament. UPND has 58, 14 independents, and, you know, two, uh, three MMD and one from uh, our great mother. Um, if, uh, no, no, I'm busy. Uh, so <laughs> uh, if, if the Patriotic Front is very serious about debating, there are certain laws within the House that sometimes are violated, uh, even point of orders that are raised that are not followed up and so on and so forth. And sometimes the UPND feels that within the House, there is uh, injustice. And let me also submit here that if my brother and the party and parliament are serious about uh, empowering people who are differently abled, right now I don't know a single minister who is differently abled. I will stand here to be corrected. I do not know a single minister in this government. Why would you wait for Bill, Bill 10 to appoint somebody who is differently? Uh, I think we all know what that is. Okay, number one. Number two, if Bill 10 reassures freedom of expression and so on and so forth, 
my colleagues and I would not have gone into the bush on June 22nd because the police wanted to kill us. And another minister who belongs to that parliament said, break their bones. If Bill, Bill 10 was really the document to give us minister, rights, yeah? you know Honorable Tutuangulube is on record for Who's saying, I mean, uh, Chief Whip and Member of Parliament for, uh, for Kabwe, uh, beg your pardon. So if these rights were really serious, Zambians would already be enjoying these rights. This government is using Bill 10 as a cover the same way the white people enslaved black people and then freed them and created Martin Luther Day as a holiday, but yet the black people are still not free. Zambians are not free under this government to talk. We're not free to talk. We are, not, we are always scared because laws have been manipulated and that's why members of parliament from UPND walk away because even there in parliament, our members of parliament have been beaten. They have been punched by people who say, I should have been punched more because mm. the police won't arrest that other person for whatever reason. We need a country where laws are fair for my brother, for myself, and for everybody. All right, let's, let's move on to uh, partly one of the last issues that we're supposed to discuss, that is COVID-19. I do know that, uh, you know, the entire globe is currently grappling with COVID-19. And uh, this question goes to Mr. Chanda. Um, the fight against COVID-19, as a country, are we winning? Thank you so much, moderator. The fight against COVID calls for everyone, irrespective of your political affiliation, gender, age, class, it demands that all of us as citizens work together to ensure that even as we embark on the new normal, accepting that we must exist alongside COVID, it is important for all of us to adhere to the regulations set by government through the Ministry of Health. And so, are we winning with a fight against COVID? I can say that so far, Zambia is one of the best practices in the manner that it has handled COVID. And this has been reported in different media. That other countries have looked at how Zambia is responding to COVID. Remember that when we recorded the first few cases of COVID, some of our colleagues uh, in the opposition, and in particular my brother Mubitanawa's party, called for a complete lockdown, a complete shutdown. Your marketeers must not be in markets. Your bus, your bus drivers mustn't be on the road. Your, your barbershops mustn't open. Your saloons must remain closed. A complete lockdown. For a poor family, and they're in the majority in this country, they cannot manage to stock up for more than a day. It's a reality that we have to live with. And so the President of the Republic of Zambia said, we are going to make decisions informed by science and fact. Science and fact are not decisions informed by fear. To this day, some of our colleagues are still in self-imposed quarantine because they don't want to meet the general membership. But society, the world over, is moving forward and saying, can we embrace the new normal? Can we live alongside COVID? The attitude with which we approach COVID, not just as a government issue and as a ministry issue, but as a society issue, as a national issue becomes very important. That is the more reason why whenever there's been any alarm raised on the side of the patriotic front, that when we've met our people, some of our people are not wearing masks, we have gone back to the drawing table and said to ourselves, how can we make it better next time? How can we make it better next time? Um, let me come to you, Mr. Mr. Nawa. Now we are in a period of economic inactivity, and I think we've seen uh, what the PF are doing to ensure that uh, uh, the businesses you know, remain afloat in this period of in economic inactivity. What else would you have done different you know, as the UPND you know, if, 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 if paradventure you are in power? So first of all, 
COVID, no one um, is happy about COVID. Mm. Let's be on the record. Okay? Nobody planned for COVID. The 200 plus people who have died in Zambia, may their souls rest in peace. And those who have recovered, we thank God they've recovered. And we are so blessed as a nation that we haven't had such um, catastrophic deaths uh, in our nation. Having said that, it is clear that COVID-19 is a wonderful opportunity for the Patriotic Front. It's a blessing in disguise because the Patriotic Front was broke before COVID-19. When COVID-19 came, it was, it was like just, you know, one of those calamities that you thank God for. I'll give you an example. The Japanese government donated to, through COVID fund 33 million U.S. dollars, which came to about 520 million kwacha. Just the, the government of Japan. The Zambian, one of our big companies in Zambia, donated over 30, almost 30 million kwacha. This government took COVID money, COVID money, and took it to roads. That's why I said they are so good at building roads. They should have just been ministers of infrastructure development. COVID-19 has been mismanaged by this government. If you look at the Presidential Initiative Fund, they keep having crusades, no masks, nothing. And these crusades, they are having them in their strongholds. To some extent, in my view, COVID-19 was a calamity for Zambia, but COVID-19 has hurt businesses. I run a school. I run a school. It's closed up to now. I employ a lot of people. My school is closed because of COVID. Some nightclubs that are owned by Zambians are still closed. But nightclubs that are owned by wealthy friends of our colleagues, they are open. COVID-19 has been used to, different, to, to make, put people at a disadvantage. And I would have done this differently. I would have opened the economy a little bit quicker and a little bit fairer to everybody. We can't have COVID-19 for rich people and COVID-19 for poor people. Let's have the same rules, all in all. I hope and I wish this government would have been more transparent. The Minister of Health was asked by a journalist, how much money have you received? The Minister of <coughs> Health said, you, who has sent you to ask me that question? There is no transparency over COVID-19. They are giving an individual a 4.5 million kwacha contract to make masks. Who makes masks for 4.5 million kwacha? We shouldn't use COVID-19 to benefit ourselves, our party, our friends, or anybody. We should use COVID-19 funds to put them back in the hands of the affected communities. Yeah. Uh, we have about two minutes to go, and I'll give one each uh, minute. Um, several such organizations have called uh, for a lifestyle audit uh, in the lives of whoever, you know, wants to take up public office. In one minute, Mr. In Mr. Chanda, why do you think this is important as we head towards the elections next year? It's very important uh, because uh, anyone who aspires for national leadership, whether as a councillor, member of parliament, mayor, president, must come under public scrutiny. So it is a proposition that I would personally support because it's a step in the right direction. As you know that we still have politicians still struggling to tell us how they got where they are. So I support that we must have a uh, lifestyle audit. Very, very important. And let me, for my brother's comfort and for the comfort of those watching us by way of television tonight, regarding COVID funds, the Auditor General's Office has put up a team of auditors to audit COVID resources. This report, the Auditor General's report, as we know, is presented to all stakeholders, including Parliament and uh, citizens, will have to see where has money been misappropriated. So for now, all that can be done is speculation. All Let's right. wait for the Auditor General. All right, let, let me come to you. In one minute, we're about to close. Automatically, the, the TV will shut down if we cross the one minute. All right. The 20th of August, 1940, Winston Churchill said the following words as he was celebrating the Royal Air Force and said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few, end of quote. There is so much, the few people who lead this nation owe the so many 18 million people of this nation. A lifestyle audit is yeah. just one of them. What Zambia needs is true leadership that can manage an economy Thank and you. inspire its citizens. Thank you so much, Mr. Nawa. Thank you so much, Mr. Chanda. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, we come to the end of tonight's edition of Blunt Talk. I've been your host. My name is Andrew Mwansa.
Uh, tomorrow we have uh, a special interview uh, with uh, State Council. Um, 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 yeah, I, th I think I, I should have gotten the name, but ensure that you tune in at exactly uh, 20 hours for a special interview right here on Movie TV. Good night.